So moving on with our next skill in electrochemistry, we are going to learn how to diagram voltaic cells. So I think this is a pretty fun exercise because it allows us to draw some neat pictures that explain what happens in a voltaic cell, which is really what a battery is. So we're gonna learn how to do that. A phrase that's important to think about is an ox and a red cat. So why this is important is it's gonna help us remember that the anode is the compartment that oxidation happens in and the cathode is where reduction occurs. So lots of little mnemonic devices in this learning unit that are gonna help us remember some important pieces of information. So we're gonna be learning about voltaic cells, but voltaic cells are a kind of electrochemical cell, which is basically where we have redox chemistry happening in two separate departments or compartments. So the main difference between the two kinds of um, electrochemical cells is the voltaic cell or a galvanic cell uses a spontaneous reaction. So delta G, our free energy is going to be negative there. And we use that to generate electrical energy. So the system is going to be able to provide and do work on the surroundings. Batteries are a classic example of a voltaic or a galvanic cell. An electrolytic cell basically has the same compartments and the same kinds of chemistry that are happening, but we're doing an uphill reaction, which means we actually need to provide energy in for that process to happen. So that process is going to have a positive free energy. It's non-spontaneous, but we can push non-spontaneous reactions uphill, if you will, if we provide energy to do so. And in this case, the surroundings need to provide that energy to do work on the system. And electroplating is a great example of how this works that uses electricity to actually plate out a metal on another surface. Okay, so this is just a nice pictorial representation of the differences between these voltaic and electrolytic cells. So we are going to be focusing mainly on these voltaic cells. And this is where our system is going to be providing energy out. That's how a battery works. It provides that energy. The only thing that's really different here with an electrolytic cell is because this reaction is being run kind of in the reverse, the non-spontaneous direction, we need to provide energy in. But with both of these processes, we're gonna have oxidation half reactions, reduction half reactions that sum up to an overall reaction. The only difference is whether energy is going into the system if we have an electrolytic cell or we're getting energy out of the system if we've got a voltaic cell. So how these chemistries work, this is the same redox chemistry that we talked about when we balanced you know, chemical equations, redox uh, equations in our last skill here. But what we do to harness this energy is we separate the transfer of those electrons in compartments that are joined by a wire. So by those electrons needing to move through a wire, that's how we generate um, our power. And that's really what electricity is. Electricity is electrons moving through wires. And so we're gonna set up these two um, redox reactions. Remember when we did our balancing, we actually split them into an oxidation and a reduction half reaction. We're gonna do the same situation here, and we're gonna split these into what we call half cells. They're actually two separate containers. We'll talk about all these pieces and sort of the anatomy of, um, uh, of a voltaic cell here in just a little bit. But what we have is we have um, two species that are going to be um, the oxidized and reduced forms in one part of our half cell. And then we've got other things over here that are the oxidized and reduced forms in the other half of our cell. So we separate them by a wire, and that's what's going to allow these electrons to trans, uh, move through that wire. But because we're moving charge um, via these electrons, we also have to make sure we balance charge. So there's something here called a salt bridge, and this allows ions to move freely between compartments because we need to maintain electrical neutrality. So even though we're having negative electrons move, we need to maintain neutrality. So we've got these uh, salt ions that are going to be able to move back and forth. Notice these are ions that we've seen before that are not ions that really participate in doing any kind of chemistry, right? Sodium ions was almost always a cation, right? I should say it is always a cation. We've got sulfate that is often a uh, spectator ion because it's not, you know, going, it's a conjugate base of a very strong acid, sulfuric acid. Sometimes we saw sulfate salts that would precipitate, but sodium sulfate is a very soluble salt. Okay, so we're gonna pick this um, apart and I'm gonna show you uh, the kinds of things you're going to need to do 
to do um, some chemistry with this. Now I will highlight this is going to be your in-person quiz. You're going to need to diagram a voltaic cell, okay? All right, so let's split this up a little bit more. We're gonna look at uh, the zinc copper reaction. This is gonna be sort of our, um, our exemplar here, our example that we're going to use. So we're gonna have zinc and zinc ions and copper and copper ions. So we've actually spent some time when we balanced our redox equations, understanding kind of what the half cell reactions were. And so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna put these into separate compartments. So remember how I talked about anox? The anode is where oxidation occurs. So the oxidation half cell, and by formalism, we always write the anode on the left. So that's gonna be a piece that we'll need to know here for our um, voltaic cells. Our oxidation reaction is going to be this zinc, zinc two plus. So we're gonna have this electrode here, that's a bar of zinc metal. We're gonna have zinc ions that are in solution here, and that's provided by zinc sulfate. And what's gonna happen in this electrochemical process, because zinc is being oxidized, zinc is going from zinc to zinc two plus. So this zinc bar is going to be losing electrons, and so it's gonna be losing mass, and these electrons are gonna be conducted out of the cell and go over to the cathode compartment, okay? Electrons are generated at the anode via that oxidation, and so the anode is going to be negatively charged. So these are some of these little pieces that you wanna make sure you know so that when you are diagramming a voltaic cell, you put all these pieces in. Anodes on the left, we have to make sure we know what reaction is the oxidation reaction, but we're gonna have electrons move from the anode over to the cathode. We are going to lose mass of uh, the electrode over here because we are um, losing um, zinc metal to become zinc ions. Okay. And that um, anode or is going to be negatively charged. That electrode on the left on the anode side will be negatively charged. So some of these things are going to be constants. We're always going to see them in our voltaic cells here. That's our oxidation half cell. Let's move over to the reduction half cell. This is our copper half cell over here. So in this case, we're going to have electrons coming in and uh, coming into this cathode, which is positively charged. I always like to write cathode with a plus sign as that T, because that reminds me that the cathode is positive. So when we have electrons coming over here to the cathode, they're looking to reduce something. So they're going to take these copper ions that are in solution, and they're going to plate them out as copper metal on the electrode. So we're gonna see that the mass of this electrode is actually going to increase. So we're gonna have a um, electrode that's a bar of copper metal. We're gonna have a copper electrolyte solution, so we can have copper sulfate that's there. And then we're going to have that copper bar gaining electrons and thus gaining mass by the electrons that are coming into the cell from the anode compartment. Electrons are accepted at the cathode via reduction, so the cathode is going to be positively charged. I know that can be a little bit confusing because you're like, wait a minute, I've got electrons that are coming over here, but they're coming over there because we have a positive charge here. Okay, so that's what happens at the reduction half cell. So if we mix these two solutions sort of together, we could have redox chemistry happen, but the idea is, is we don't want them to trade their electrons in solution. We want them to actually have their electrons be conducted through a wire so we can harness that energy. So putting this all together and completing the circus, circus, circuit, we're gonna have an imbalance of charge that occurs because of this redox chemistry. So when we have reduction that occurs at the cathode, remember that's what's happening over here, these copper two plus ions are going to be going out of solution and becoming copper metal. So we're gonna be depleting cations from our cathode, okay? Oxidation occurring at the anode is going to deplete the solution of anions, or thought of another way, we're gonna be adding cations to that solution so it's becoming more charged. And so we're going to have a liquid wire that we call a salt bridge that's going to allow cations and anions to freely flow through this solution, and that's going to allow us to maintain this charge neutrality, okay? So we're going to have cations kind of flowing over to the cathode because, remember, we're depleting those positive charges there. And anodes, or the anode compartment is going to have an influx of anions because we need to balance the fact that we're depleting anions and we're actually generating more cations in solution. So some of this might just be stuff you need to kind of memorize. 
you do it several times, practice a few times, so you sort of get it in, in, in your head in terms of where all these pieces are moving. Because at the end of the day, what we're gonna need to do is draw a picture of a voltaic cell. So one other thing that I kind of wanted to highlight is sort of a, a formalism that we might see here. So highlighting the, the, the flow of this charge, we might see something that kind of starts to represent what we see here on, uh, on this page. And we're going to call this a shorthand notation, but let's kind of look at what's happening here. In our anode compartment, right, zinc is being oxidized to zinc 2 plus, okay? These electrons are going through this wire and coming over here to reduce copper 2 plus to copper metal. Now sulfate anions are going to be moving over here. S um, uh, sodium cations are moving over here. And um, uh, the convention that we're always going to see is that our anode is on the left and our cathode is on the right. So this is just kind of moving us towards what I'm going to call a shorthand notation by taking the same information that was in those pictures and drawing them in a little bit easier format that we have here. Okay. So what this leads us to is... Um, a shorthand notation. But I want to show you one more example of redox chemistry that involves um, something that's not a metal. So in this zinc copper voltaic cell, right, the electrodes are what are active, right? We're having redox chemistry happen there because we're having zinc going to zinc 2 plus and copper 2 plus going to copper. So those metals are directly participating in the chemistry. We might have redox chemistry, and I've got an example here that I'll show you in just a second, where we're not having the electrode participate in the chemistry. So we need to use an inactive electrode. So you'll see these as often graphite or carbon or platinum electrodes. And these are going to be happening when there are redox chemistry reagents that are not metals. They might be ions or gases or, or other things. So let's take a look here at here's a redox reaction that we're having where we're having um, iodide as an anion, right, is being oxidized to iodine as a solid. So neither of these is a redox active metal. So we still have this redox chemistry happening, okay, but what's going to happen now is this carbon electrode, this graphite electrode, is really just providing the surface for these guys to get together. So what we can see here is in our anode half reaction, we're actually going to be generating a solid. So that's why we're actually going to see an accumulation of iodine as a solid on this electrode. So this electrode is actually going to increase in mass. So make sure to take note of this. When we went back over here, remember this, this was our anode over here. This electrode actually got smaller, right? It actually lost mass. So that's not always going to be the case. We have to know the chemistry that's going on to understand in this situation our anode is actually going to be increasing in mass because of the redox chemistry that's happening there. But it's largely because we have a uh, an inactive electrode that's helping there. All right, so let's look at what the reduction reaction is. Here's the reduction reaction. We've got permanganate. Okay, permanganate undergoes a um, redox reaction where it's uh, reduced to generate manganese 2 plus cations. So it's a reduction reaction, but we just stay within ion forms. You can see here nothing is happening to this electrode, but it is still providing sort of the platform for these two ions to get together to um, participate in redox chemistry. So highlighting that we might see inactive electrodes. Graphite or platinum are typically what we see. Platinum, again, being a fairly inert metal. So diagramming voltaic cells. I'll show you kind of the picture that I'll provide for you, but let's go through and kind of take, take apart the anatomy of this. Some things that you need to include if you diagram a voltaic cell is you have to name the electrode, okay? And so we have to say sort of and label what the electrode is. In this case, I'm looking back at that reaction we just did with the inactive um, uh, electrodes. We need to be naming what they are. So we're going to put that they're uh, graphite electro uh, electrodes there, carbon electrodes, okay? We need to know that by convention, the anode is on the left, so make sure you put all of your oxidation chemistry happening on the left, okay? The direction of electron flow, this is something that'll always be the same. Electrons flow from the anode to the cathode, so using this formalism, we're always gonna show electron flow in the right direction. And when you have to diagram a cell, I'll make sure to give you the list of things that you have to make sure to include so you don't forget something, because there is a lot to this. We have to be able to think about and write the half cell reactions that are occurring, okay? So we have to be able to identify um, the uh, reaction that's happening in the cathode, 
right? So that's going to be our reduction half reaction. So you'd want to be able to write this reaction and know that that's what's happening here. And then here's the oxidation half reaction. So part of that builds on skills that we did in our first skill here on writing and balancing redox, half, or redox reactions. So once we have our um, oxidation and reduction half reactions, then we need to know the species that will be then present in each compartment, right? So everything except for the electrons are going to be what needs to be in those compartments. So you actually need to write within the compartment what's there. So probably underneath here, you'll kind of write and label um, what the redox half reaction is, but then you need to write the species that are present in that half cell. So again, half cell components include both the electrode materials, which we already kind of labeled up top here, um, whatever ions are in solution, um, and, and so forth. And then we need to also label what we're going to be using as um, salt bridge ions. Usually this is going to be a very soluble salt that's not redox active. So something like we saw sodium sulfate in our previous example. We can see potassium nitrate here. Okay, so we want to label uh, what we're going to have as our salt bridge and making sure to label the direction that those ions flow in. So that is diagramming a voltaic cell. I know this was a lot, particularly if it's not something that you've seen before. Okay, one last thing to highlight here before we go through an example is how you might see this as a shorthand notation. So this is going to be, for example, what I will show you on your quiz. I will show you something that looks like this. This is what we call a shorthand notation. So I want to make sure to highlight how to read a shorthand notation. You'll have some problems where you might have to identify a shorthand notation. But everything that's on the left is going to be our anode. So we write it on the left. This double bar indicates the separation between the anode and the cathode compartment. Okay, so this tells me what's going on in the anode compartment. This tells me what's going on in the cathode compartment. Okay, single lines indicate phase changes between things, even though we could see that there's a phase change here. Just by formalism, we say that there's zinc and then zinc ions, so those are different phases, so we have this bar that's there. Same thing happening on the uh, cathode side. So this is all that you will get to diagram a voltaic cell. So not a lot of information there, but we need to be able to use that information to write redox half reactions and use those to diagram what we're going to see in our cell. So in this case, we know that we're gonna have redox active electrodes. Okay, so those are our solid metals there. And so this is the same one that we've already talked about and diagrammed here. So shorthand notation is really important. Here's the shorthand notation that we'd see for that other example where we had inert electrodes. Okay, so we indicate there's our graphite electrode. Okay, the inert electrode has to be specified. Okay, and then we've got here, we've got aqueous and solid species on the left and a whole bunch of aqueous species on the right. Notice if you have more than one aqueous species, we separate them by commas, okay? So especially if this is a new skill, I encourage you to watch the extra credit videos that are gonna allow you to not only earn some extra points, but practice this skill a little bit more than we're gonna be able to do just in class, okay? So steps for diagramming a voltaic cell. Like we did when we balance redox equations, I'm not going to go through the details here because I will go through the details as we go through an example here. But the first thing that you need to be able to do is either break apart a redox reaction or look at the shorthand notation and be able to write what the half cell reactions are. And then you're going to add those redox components into each compartment, knowing that the anode is going to be on the left. That's where our oxidation reaction is. Cathode is on the right for the reduction reaction. And then add any remaining pieces. Identify the electron direction, uh, the salt bridge, so where are ions flowing. And if known, add uh, the voltmeter uh, value to that top square. So I'll indicate what these are. And you'll also have, when you do these problems, a little checklist to make sure you know all these pieces to include. So this little piece about adding what the voltage is, we're not actually going to learn how to calculate that until our next skill. So we're not going to put that in just yet, but that's going to be our next skill is learning how to calculate that. All right, so this is this is the picture that you'll be given. When it comes time for your in-person quiz, you're going to bring in a blank piece of paper that you have this printed out on, okay? There'll be a prompt that'll be up on the screen, and I'll have a checklist of all the things that you need to make sure to label on this generic version of a voltaic cell. Okay, so let's go through and practice a problem. 
All right, you ready to try one on our own? So this is a sample problem. I think it's sample problem 20.2 that's in your textbook. Um, how to diagram a voltaic cell. So again, this has a lot of information it's asking us to provide. It says draw the diagram, show balanced equations, and then write the notation for a voltaic cell that consists of one half cell with a chromium bar and a chromium nitrate solution, another half cell with a silver bar and a silver nitrate solution, and they tell us that we've got a potassium nitrate salt bridge. Now, this is an important piece of information that they give us with this problem. We'll actually learn in our next lecture that we could have figured out who was the anode and who was the cathode, but because we haven't learned that yet, they give us a little piece of information here that tells us who's being oxidized and who's being reduced, okay? So I wanna highlight that you'll always be provided sort of a diagram, it looks like this. Okay, oops, I have some answers there. It looks like that you'll actually be provided with that skeleton diagram, so you don't need to worry about drawing that, but you will have to label all the relative pieces. So I'm gonna walk you through sort of a three-step process here for how to do that. The first thing is we're gonna label any pieces that are gonna be the same for any problem. That's identifying the anode, the cathode, the direction of electron flow. And again, once you've identified the anode, you know where the oxidation half reaction occurs and you know that that electrode is negative. Same thing for the cathode. That tells us where the reduction chemistry happens. And again, it tells us which electrode is positive. So that's always gonna be the same. The next thing you need to do is you need to look at who's in solution and then break those things apart to determine your half reactions and your overall chemistry. Now this could be something that we're gonna build on the skills that we had from our first lecture. Remember, we sort of had to pull apart and identify who looked like they belonged together in a half reaction. And again, we might need to have some, pro uh, some help from information in our problem to help determine, for example, which is the oxidation and which is the reduction reaction. And what I've highlighted in blue here is that information that helps us, right? It tells us that the chromium electrode is negative relative to the silver electrode. So that tells us that chromium is where oxidation is occurring, okay? So that's gonna be an important little piece to our puzzle. Once we kind of start building up the kinds of chemistry that's going in solution, then we basically need to make sure we assign everything to the right compartments, to the right solutions, answer questions about what might be going on in solution, which electrodes getting heavier, are concentrations of this species increasing or decreasing, and so forth. So let's go ahead and start this problem. The first thing I want you to do is try to, if you're given a blank diagram, and there are blank diagrams that are available on Blackboard, you can just kind of download, it just says a voltaic um, cell blank diagram. Um, try labeling um, the things that are the same for any problem. Where are these things going to be? So again, I'm gonna pause the video uh, periodically here, encourage you to pause it so that you can try to work through this solution. All right here, so again, anything that's gonna be sa the same for any problem is what I've shown here in blue. Again, we know that the anode is gonna be on the left, that's where oxidation occurs. This electrode is going to be negatively charged. Cathode is going to be on the right, that's where reduction occurs. This electrode will be positively charged. Electrons always flow from um, right to left, and I didn't draw it on here, but we could always say that anions are gonna to flow to the anode cations will flow to the cathode through our salt bridge here. And they did tell us the identity of what our salt bridge was. They did say that we've got a potassium nitrate salt bridge. So we'd know in that case that nitrate's gonna flow this way, potassium's gonna flow that way. So there is one other thing that we could add on this before we actually knew anything about the chemistry going on. But that kind of gets us started here. The next part is probably the most challenging because we need to think about splitting up all the pieces of information they gave into an oxidation half reaction, which will occur on the left, and a reduction half reaction that will occur on the right. So again, they gave us some pieces of information here. They told us that the chromium chemistry is going to be occurring at the anode because they tell us that's the negative electrode. So look at the species that we have in solution, right? And see if you can figure out what the two half reactions are that are occurring in each half cell.
are right here. So again, the second step is to say, all right, who is in solution? And then determine the half reactions and the overall chemistry that's happening. So again, we knew that we had chromium nitrate, we've got silver nitrate, potassium nitrate, and then obviously they told us we've got a silver electrode and a, uh, and a chromium electrode. So because they told us that the chromium electrode was negative, we do know now that the chromium is what's going to be in our um, oxidation, our anode compartment. And so if we write chemistry based on the species that we're given, we know that we have chromium 3 plus and we've got chromium as a solid because that's our active electrode. Chromium going to chromium 3 plus is going to uh, lose three electrons. Note here, we know we can't write it this way, right? Hopefully we recognize we can't write this chemistry, even though we know the chromium electrode is on the left and this is chromium chemistry. We know that this can't be the chemistry that happens because this is the anode compartment. Anode is where oxidation occurs, so this part can't happen. All right, so here's our oxidation half reaction. So that must be must mean that silver stuff is going on in the cathode compartment. All right, we know we've got a solid silver electrode, and since we know it's reduction, we know that the electrons have to be on the left side as a reactant. So that must mean silver ions from our silver nitrate solution are gonna gain electrons and become silver solid. Note here, and this is where we bring in skills from our first lecture, in order to have this be a balanced chemical equation, we have to scale up the number of electrons that are gained in our reduction half reaction to match that that are lost by our oxidation. So we have to scale this guy up by three, and doing that is gonna give us our balanced overall redox equation. That was one of the things that this problem also asked for, was a balanced uh, chemical redox equation. The last thing that we want to do is label everything that's going on in here. And I want you guys to pause for a second and see if you can figure out what to label in here. All right, if this is our redox reaction that occurs in the anode compartment, so it's oxidation, that must mean, again, we know that our chromium electrode is going to be over here. We know that our chromium 3 plus ions are in solution there. If we were to address some questions about how would the concentration or the masses of these be changing, the mass of this chromium electrode would be decreasing because those chromium metal ion or metal um, atoms are becoming chromium ions. So again, the concentration of chromium is going to be increasing. Let's go over here to our silver. In our silver compartment, again, we know that our silver electrode is going to be taking silver ions, combining them with electrons to make solid silver. So that means the mass of that silver electrode is increasing. And that must mean that we're depleting silver ions from solution. So that concentration is decreasing. The last thing to sort of uh, put in uh, here is this concept of where are our salt ions moving. So they told us we had a potassium nitrate salt bridge. And again, you can remember that anions go to the anode or always have a logic check. Understand why, because that way you don't need to worry about memorizing it backwards. We're going to be increasing the concentration of chromate ions in solution here, which means this is becoming more positively charged. So we need to combat that by moving more negative charge over there. On the flip side, we're decreasing the positive concentration over here because we're removing silver ions from solution, so we need to replace them with potassium ions to maintain that electrical neutrality. So the last little piece that we have up on top here has us diagramming that voltaic cell using that shorthand notation. So all it really shows is the redox active species in the correct compartments. And again, that's just going to be a way that tells us who, you know, who's in which compartment. And again, we usually bracket the outsides of these with what our electrodes are. All right, so a lot of information there, but hopefully you sort of see it as a fun little puzzle to put together to figure out what does this voltaic cell look like.